Birds of Sanibel. As you drive across the causeway to Sanibel, you are entering an island that has been dedicated as a sanctuary to preserve wildlife. It is an outstanding place to see birds. There are many places to look. The J.N. Ding Darling National Wildlife Refuge has acres of tidal flats with mangrove islands. As well as fresh or brackish shallows that are preferred by many species. The Sanibel Captiva Conservation Foundation Nature Center and the Bailey Tract of the Refuge border an inland freshwater slough that lines the center of the island and is called the Sanibel River. Stretching north from the lighthouse are 13 miles of sandy beach on the gulf. And the Causeway Islands also have sandy beaches on the bay. Many of the pictures shown in this program were taken with telephoto lenses that make the birds look over 40 times closer than they actually are. This ruddy turnstone in the telephoto lens is the small dot near the center in this picture with the normal lens. Please don't try to take similar pictures with an ordinary camera by getting close to the birds. You will only scare them and may possibly harm them. <laughs> Sit down and view the tape as many times as you would like. But most of all, get out and see the birds of Sanibel. The pied-billed grebe can be seen in all seasons, usually on the left side of the road in Ding Darling Wildlife Refuge and on other inland water on Sanibel, preferring fresh water. It is no larger than the smallest of the ducks and swims and dives for food. It has a high chicken-like bill that has a black ring around it during breeding season. The bird rarely flies, preferring to swim away from danger. It can control its buoyancy to change its level or sink in the water. The long, thin neck and heavy bill identify it. The white pelican is the largest bird that you will see on Sanibel, with a five-foot length and a nine-and-a-half-foot wingspan. You can see from this picture how much larger it is than the heron and the ibis. They are gregarious birds that are normally found in groups and in association with other species, particularly the double-crested cormorant. They can frequently be seen in the wintertime in the Ding Darling Refuge, either in the back of the ponds to the left or in the last pond on the right, which enters into the bay. The white pelican does not dive for food as the brown pelican does. It scoops its food as it swims majestically along on the surface, filling its pouch with water and fish and straining out the fish to swallow. When the water is shallow, it lays its bill on its side to fill. It eats about three pounds of fish a day.
Frequently, you will see a line of pelicans herding the fish as they move forward. In the spring, a fibrous fin grows on the upper mandible that drops off after the eggs are laid. When the white pelican flies, you can see that it has black markings along the trailing edge of the wing from the tip to about one foot from the body. The wood stork, which looks similar when flying, has black along the entire trailing edge of the wing. You can occasionally see flocks of pelicans flying high overhead. The brown pelicans may be endangered in other areas, but they're everywhere on Sanibel. Pelicans glide in the updrafts along the edge of the causeway bridges and along the trees on the Gulf Shore. They also fly just over the ocean or bay to use the ground effect to save energy. They dive headlong into the water for fish and follow every fisherman around begging for handouts. They also feed by gulping a pouch full of water and small fish and straining the fish out to swallow. They have brown heads and light underbodies when young and brown bodies with silver white heads that may be washed with yellow in winter. In breeding season, they have a deep reddish-brown stripe on the back of the neck. From a boat, we can see white nestlings with a parent in this nest on a mangrove island in the bay. No, the parent isn't eating these two young birds. The young find their food down deep in the parent's craw. In the evening, the pelicans fly at treetop level, or just above the water, back towards the wildlife refuge to roost for the night on the mangroves. The pelicans are doing just fine on Sanibel. Double-crested cormorants are common in this area at all times of the year.
The sleek black bodies can be seen swimming underwater as they feed. Frequently in the company of other birds that take advantage of their herding of the fish. As their wing feathers have little oil so that they wet easily for better swimming, cormorants sometimes spread them out to dry, as the unhingas do. The young are a brown color above with some white underneath. The cormorant has a very short tail so that it can stand on the ground, although it is commonly seen perched on a piling or a branch. The bill has a sharp hook on the end, is much thinner than that of the loon, and is held up at an angle. The orange color of the bill and face become brighter during the breeding season. This bird is sitting on eggs in a nest in a mangrove tree on a rookery island while the mate preens. The young chicks peck at the parent's bill asking for food. They finally are fed from deep in the parent's craw. Cormorants can sometimes be seen performing a sky-pointing ceremony while nesting. The cormorant flies to its destination in a straight line and flaps almost continuously. The anhinga is commonly called the snake bird because when it swims to catch fish, it raises its head out of the water like a snake. It uses its long neck to drive the sharp bill forward to spear the fish. It then shakes the fish off the bill and catches it in the air to swallow. After swimming, the anhinga can only fly with difficulty with its wet feathers, so it climbs up onto the mangroves to dry its wings. The buff-colored neck shows that this is a female bird. The older birds, like this all-black male, develop a beautiful silver-white pattern on the wings. The feathers have a different structure from other birds so that they will absorb water for easier swimming. Here you see a bird reaching to the oil gland on the tail for oil to preen the feathers. The anhingas nest in this area and you can see three young birds on this nest. When they are two weeks old and cannot yet fly, the nestlings will climb down to the water and back. This picture shows a young bird getting food from the craw of a parent. The parents continue to feed the young until they can fish for themselves. The bird appears long in flight and glides between groups of wing strokes. The longer neck, longer tail, and straight bill distinguish the anhinga from the cormorant. In the evening, this bird spreads its wings to catch the last rays of the setting sun.
The great blue heron is four feet tall, the largest of the heron and egret family, and is around the island in all seasons. It has a blue-gray color, and the mature birds have black epaulets on their shoulders. Great herons are territorial, and have been seen to fight with others of their kind, using their bills to stab and slash. Like the other egrets and herons, their heads are drawn back and their legs extended as they fly. They stalk the marshes for fish, other aquatic life and insects, and take advantage of any opportunity. I noticed a fish that had beached itself for a few seconds on the shore. A great blue quickly scooped it up and swallowed it whole. You may see them resting or sleeping with their heads drawn down and their eyes closed. The great blue generally nests near the top of the rookery. This young nestling is being cared for by the parents in their breeding plumage with white neck and head. Both parents share the jobs of feeding the young and guarding the nest. The young bird asks for food by grasping the bill of the parent. The parent regurgitates food into the nest in front of the chick. The nestlings grow rapidly and soon are testing their wings in the breeze. The young birds that have left the nest show little fear of humans and may come very close, as this one did in the Bailey tract of the wildlife refuge. The great egret, the queen of the herons, is a large white bird that can be found on all parts of Sanibel in all seasons, even around the houses and yards. The bird gives the impression of being stately and proper. During the mating season, the bill turns brighter orange and lacy plumes grow on the back to below the tail feathers. Early in this century, the plumes of the great egret and the snowy egret were collected for hats, almost to the bird's extinction. The great egrets nest in the mangrove rookeries along with the other water birds. As the birds grow, they test their new wings in the breeze. This adult bird stands in an eager forward leaning pose as it stalks its food of fish, frogs, anoles, and insects.
The great egret can be distinguished from the smaller snowy by its yellow bill, black feet, and its stately manner. When the bird flies, it holds its head back with its dark feet extended. If the great egret is the queen, the snowy egret is the princess of the herons. It is much smaller than the great egret, but matches it in beauty and charm. It is an all-white bird with a yellow lore between the eye and the solid black bill. During breeding season, fine white plumes appear hanging from the back and neck. The bird acts much less formal than the great egret and seems to be having fun. When feeding, the snowy will sometimes appear to dance across the water, picking up minnows. The golden slippers on dark colored legs are the most obvious identifier. If the feet are in water, the bird can be distinguished by the black bill rather than the blue with black tip of the immature little blue and the flesh color and black tip of the white phase of the reddish egret. This picture shows the size difference between the snowy and the great egret. The little blue heron is a solitary bird that can be found throughout the year on all of the inland water of Sanibel. It is a uniform slate blue color with dull yellow green legs and a black tipped bluish bill that gets brighter in breeding season. The bird is diligent as it slowly stalks along the water's edge looking for food. It never seems to rest from its search for fish, invertebrates, and insects. Surprisingly, the immature bird is pure white with the same bluish bill and lighter green legs. During the first spring molts, the blue feathers begin to appear as they have on this bird. The little blue has a uniform blue-gray color when flying. When the bird is seen from the back, the blue phase may be confused with the tricolor that has white underneath. The young little blue may be confused with the snowy that has yellow feet, an all black bill, and yellow lores. The tricolor heron is a slate gray color above with white underneath. There is a white plume on the back of the head and a splotchy white line extends down the front of the neck from just below the black tipped blue bill. The tricolor feeds actively over all areas of the marsh and may use canopy feeding techniques similar to those used by the reddish egress. It behaves in a more relaxed and fun filled way and the diligent little blue.
The white underparts help to distinguish the tricolor from the little blue when it is flying. These pictures, taken in early May, show tricolor nestlings just a few days old. The nest was in the roadside park on Periwinkle Way, just west of Donnock Street, and could be seen from the picnic area. The nest was about four feet over the water in cattail reeds. Both parents share the chores of tending the eggs for over three weeks until they hatch, and in feeding the chicks for about five weeks until they can fly. The young birds pester the parent by pecking at their bill until they finally regurgitate some food and poke it into the beak of the most persistent offspring. The young grew rapidly and left the nest after about three weeks, but well before they could fly. A shaggy rust-colored neck on a gray body identifies the reddish egret. It has a flesh-colored bill with a black tip. They can be seen scattered around the island all year long, but mostly in the Ding Darling Refuge. An experienced observer will notice this bird more because of its behavior than by its appearance. The bird does what is called canopy feeding, where it dances around drunkenly with its wings up in the air. It is actually shading the water so that it can better see the fish. Infrequently, you may see a white bird canopy feeding. Look carefully, it may be the white phase of the reddish egret. The white phase also has a flesh-colored bill with black tip and lighter-colored bluish legs. The cattle egret, shown here in breeding plumage, has become common on Sanibel only in the last few years. The small white heron with a short neck is constantly moving. The bird feeds mostly on insects. But it has been seen to take a young or small bird, such as this warbler. It moves into the rookery near the end of the season to raise its young, chasing many of the other birds out. This picture shows a parent with two young, recently out of the nest, in the rookery. The greenback heron can be seen at any time of the year, perched on a branch a few inches above fresh or salt water, waiting for a fish, frog, or lizard to approach too close. It is a small heron with dark colors. The head is chestnut brown with a black crown. It has a blue-gray back and wings and very little green. 
The bill is dark and the legs a greenish yellow that turns orange in mating season. There's a streak of white from the throat to the belly. In the spring, they build a nest in branches low over the Sanibel River in the Bailey tract of the refuge. Three blue-green eggs were laid and tended carefully for just over three weeks. The young chicks are small as they were just hatched, but they grow rapidly. At one week, they are much larger. Soon they are wandering out of the nest. A short while later, they were walking on branches over the water and stalking food for themselves. The greenback heron can be identified in flight by the rounded wing and slate gray color. The black crowned night heron are occasionally seen perched on a low branch just over the water along fresh and salt water areas on the interior of the island. They can be seen in the daytime but forage for fish insects and crustaceans in the evening and at night. They often nest in rookeries with other species and feed on eggs and baby birds. The immature night heron is dull gray-brown with white spots on the upper sides and white streaks below. When they fly, the head is folded back with only the toes extending behind the tail. The yellow crown night heron is more common in Ding Darling Refuge than the black crown, but less common on other parts of the island. They are the original southern night heron that has been extending its range north. These birds can be seen nesting each spring in mangroves over the alligators in Ding Darling Wildlife Refuge. After much ceremony and pairing, the male brings twigs to the female to build the nest. The female lays three or four eggs and both share the task of sitting on them and shading them from the sun for over three weeks until they hatch. The young chicks at three days actively eat the food that the parent regurgitates into the nest in front of them.
The first feathers begin to appear at about a week. After leaving the nest, the immature birds are slate brown with light spots on the top and white streaks on the underside. The alligators help the birds by keeping the raccoons from the eggs. However, they eat any nestlings that fall from the nest. In 1988, the water level was too low for the alligators and the raccoons got all of the eggs. White ibises are gregarious birds and are found feeding together in the shallows or in grassy fields. Or roosting together in the trees. The immature bird is brown with white underneath and has a pinkish brown bill and brown legs. The feathers become splotchy brown and white and then pure white with succeeding molts. The adult is all white with a red face, a decurved bill and bright red legs in the breeding season. Ibises commonly fly in flocks, showing their black wingtips. They fly with their necks and legs extended. The decurved bill separates the ibises from the great and snowy egrets and from the little blues. The immature could be confused with the glossy ibis that is seldom found on Sanibel. The wood stork is much larger than the white ibis and has a black head. One of the most colorful and interesting birds on Sanibel is the roseate spoonbill. They can usually be found on one of the ponds in the Ding Darling Refuge. Except for its white neck and upper back, it is all pink with a blood red stripe on the shoulder. It has a naked greenish to black head. <laughs> the immature spoonbill has a feathered head and is white all over. The color gradually deepens over a three years period. When the bird feeds in shallow water, it moves its partly open spoon-shaped bill sideways in an arc and closes it when it feels food. This bird flies with its head and feet extended. In the evening, flocks return to the shallows across from the tower in Ding Darling Refuge and roost on the mangroves. The wood stork is a large white gregarious bird that can be seen on Sanibel. It breeds in nearby corkscrew swamp. It has a decurved blackish bill, a dark metallic looking unfeathered head and upper neck and black legs. It can be seen regularly in the non-breeding season in Ding Darling Refuge and on the golf courses.
The wood storks build their nests together, high in the cypress trees in Corkscrew Swamp, flying as much as 20 miles to find suitable fishing. They raise their young in the early spring, only if the supply of fish is promising. The birds feed in shallow water by stirring up the bottom with one foot and feeling for the fish. They cannot catch enough fish to feed the young unless the fish have been concentrated by a dry spring with receding water. In most recent years, the springs have been wet and the young have not survived. When the spring of 1988 was dry, over 1,000 young were fledged. Wood storks, efficient flying birds with their long wingspan, can be seen in flocks soaring in thermals. The black trailing edge of the wing extends all the way to the body. Both the neck and feet are well extended when flying. The wood stork is endangered and has been losing ground because of the low water and small fish population in the Everglades swamps. Its survival in this country is in doubt. The green-winged teal is the smallest of the dabbling ducks. They can usually be found in the more remote areas of the Ding Darling Refuge or out in the center of the large pond by the tower. The young have the fastest growth rate of any North American duck. They can fly in about 34 days from hatching. The males can be identified by the vertical white line on the side and the reddish brown head with green ear patch. The green-winged teal is a shy bird that tries to stay out of view. The mottled duck is a year-round resident of the island that has been called the Florida duck. Both sexes look alike and are similar to the female mallard, except for lighter plumage and a light buff head. They feed on insects, fish, small animals, and greens on the bottom of shallow ponds. They pair up in early spring and are plentiful on all of the interior waterways flying, swimming, and walking together in the Sanibel Captiva Conservation Foundation Center, the Ding Darling Refuge, or in the Bailey Tract of the Refuge. They raise their young in the hidden recesses of fresh water and will abandon the nest if disturbed. In early summer, when the young ducklings are about a month old, the parents will parade the family. The northern pintail, shown here mixed with coots, is the most streamlined of the ducks, having long, narrow wings and a long, pointed tail. 
It feeds in deeper water than most of the other dabblers and can generally be seen in the center of the large pond by the tower in Ding Darling Refuge. When the ducks first come down from the north, they have run the gauntlet of hunters at many feeding places. It is natural that they will be skittish and come closer to people only after they get accustomed to the quiet and security. Northern pintails can be identified by the sharp tail feather, as well as the white line up each side of the male's neck. The blue-winged teal is one of the earliest ducks to return to Sanibel in the fall. The male deserts the nest partway through incubation, leaving the raising of the young to the female, as do most of the ducks. The males are easily identified by the white crescent on the head. You can sometimes see a flash of the blue speculum when they preen or when they fly. They occupy the smaller freshwater ways in the SCCF, the Bailey Tract, and Ding Darling Refuge, as well as the large pond by the tower. They come closer to people than most of the other dabblers. The large black bill that is longer than the head identifies the northern shoveler. It arrives early in the season and leaves late and is usually seen near the road between the dike and tower in Ding Darling Refuge. It feeds by upending to reach food on the bottom. It may also feed by straining small plants and animals from the water surface with a comb-like edge of the bill. The female incubates the eggs more sporadically than other ducks, and the two may remain paired throughout the incubation period. The American widgeons usually flock in large numbers with the coots in the center of the large pond by the tower in the refuge. In recent years, the number of widgeons and other ducks on Sanibel has dropped drastically. This may be caused by the general reduction of habitat and the national drought of the past few years. Our local drought that has caused a shortage of fresh water for the managers to use in maintaining food supplies in the refuge may also be contributing. In most recent years, we have had a single Eurasian widgeon mixed with the flocks of American widgeons. The Eurasian is in the center of this picture. The female red-breasted merganser is regularly seen in winter in both the saltwater and freshwater ponds in Ding Darling National Wildlife Refuge. The male, which is seldom seen, has a dark head with a white ring around the neck above a reddish-brown flecked breast. Bergansers are diving ducks that feeds principally on fish and crustaceans. 
They are sometimes called sawbills because of the serrated edge of the upper mandible that is used to grasp fish. They may be seen cooperating to drive the fish into the shallow water where they are easier to catch. After feeding, the birds will commonly preen and oil their feathers with many gyrations and bathe with many splashes to keep their feathers clean and in good shape. The comic character Daffy Duck was certainly based on the merganser. The turkey vulture shown in this picture and the black vulture can generally be seen on sunny days soaring in thermals over the SCCF, Tarpon Bay, the Ding Darling Refuge and other parts of the island. In the early morning and evening when thermals are weak, they can be seen perched on dead trees or on low brush. The black vulture can usually be seen on the power poles along the road near Rabbit Road. Vultures are communal birds which gather in groups of families that stay together throughout the year. They are scavengers that use their eyesight and sensitive smell to find carrion as small as tadpoles. The black vultures also capture young birds and small mammals. As they have naked heads without feathers, they can remain clean while eating dead animals. The turkey vulture's head is red although it cannot be seen for identification except at close range. The turkey vultures are somewhat larger than the black vulture and are the more efficient flyers. They hold their wings at a pronounced V angle of dihedral and maneuver constantly to gain every bit of energy from the thermals. They generally fly higher in the thermals than the black vultures but will work the gusts just over the trees long after the black vultures are down. Their tail extends significantly behind the wing when flying. The black vultures hold their wings much flatter and will generally flap them more frequently. They will seldom maneuver much but will fly in large circles. The tails do not extend much behind the wing and white areas under the tips of the wings can sometimes be seen. The vultures are very useful in removing carrion from the island. The ospreys were decimated in the 1950 to 1970s by the effects of DDT in thinning their eggshells that caused breakage and an almost complete breeding failure. They have recovered and we have many successful nests each spring. The osprey is commonly referred to as the fish hawk because they always live near water and seldom eat anything but fish. The bird flies slowly at 30 to 100 feet above the water surface until they sight a fish. After a vertical dive, they enter the water feet first 
to grab the fish firmly with both talons. They pause in flight to shake the water off and fly to try again, or if successful, to a perch and eat the fish. When they carry a fish, it is in a streamlined position with the head forward. Dead trees are the natural nesting site of her osprey. A shortage of dead trees on the island has led them to nest on power poles, navigation markers, the city's emergency siren, and other structures. Platforms on tall poles installed in a program of the International Osprey Foundation have been adopted by the birds. Nests on these platforms have been more successful than the natural nests. The mated pairs build a nest of sticks, twigs, and brush in winter or refurbish a previous year's nest. Here you can see a flying bird break a twig off of a tree and depositing it on the nest. The male catches fish for the female from initial pairing until the eggs are laid. The female does the majority of the incubating, but they alternate so both have time to feed. After hatching, the male brings food to the female to feed the young. These three nestlings are almost ready to fly. Young birds that catch a fish can sometimes be seen flying high with the fish and screaming and swooping in big glides to proclaim to all their success. The osprey can be distinguished from eagles by the white underneath and the black lines through the eyes. An immature bald eagle can be seen spiraling high overhead in a thermal. Notice how straight and flat he holds his wings. A young bird is chasing its parent near the edge of the marsh. You can distinguish between the two because the young bird is all black until it gets its white head and tail at four or five years of age. Here a young bird is feeding on the nest while its sibling stands in a nearby tree. They have flown short distances from the nest, but come back for food. The parent birds continue to feed them until they learn to catch fish and small mammals for themselves. One of the parents watches from the top of the dead tree. There are a few bald eagles on Sanibel, although continuing development in this area of the state is reducing their territory. The eagle is often confused with the osprey, which is much smaller, has black stripes through the eyes, and is white underneath. The immature eagle is confused with the vultures, 
especially with the black vulture that also flies with a flat wing. However, the eagle is much larger. If all of the birds suddenly seem to disappear, look up. There may be an eagle overhead. The full moon still shines down as the first crack of dawn finds the red-shouldered hawk calling to its mate to join him. These birds will commonly perch on posts or trees and swoop down for any rodent that moves. They then hold the catch under one foot while they eat. The markings are not as bright on birds in this area as they are on this species in other parts of the country. The red shoulders on this bird are more obvious than on most. They don't show much fear of people and you can frequently walk to within 10 feet of them. The checkerboard pattern can be seen on the front and back when they're perching or flying. The American kestrel is a small, colorful falcon that is common on Sanibel, except in summer. It likes to perch on the highest tree or telephone pole or on the wires to search for insects, rodents, or small birds that it feeds upon. The kestrel is very difficult to photograph. It will fly away if you get a bit too close. The clapper rail is generally seen in low brush or reeds along saltwater marshes or in mangrove swamps. You should look along the right side of the road in the Ding Darling Refuge along the saltwater. As the rails are all very secretive, it takes a serious effort to see them. Although they migrate over long distances, they will generally run away from danger and seldom fly. They disappear into the vegetation. Clapper rails feed on crustaceans, especially crabs and snails. We saw this young bird, about two weeks old, out on the beach. When he saw us, he ran for cover. The young of all rails are a fuzzy black until they get their feathers. The chicks take their bath in the clear water just like the parents. It takes the young chicks 63 to 70 days from hatching to get their plumage and fly.
The common moorhens are seen and heard on the interior fresh waters of Sanibel throughout the year. They are particularly tame in the alligator area beyond the exit gates at the Ding Darling Refuge, where they get used to many people. They feed on aquatic plants, nails, mollusks, worms, and fruit that they find in shallow water and along the water's edge. The birds nest in the area in early spring and can be seen throughout the summer, teaching their young to find the best food. The young can swim and feed within a few hours of hatching. They grow rapidly and reach mature size in about six weeks. Moorhens will seldom fly, but will swim away from danger. In winter, the American coot is seen in large flocks mixed with ducks in the flats west of the tower in Ding Darling. Individual birds are usually found in the ponds on the left beyond that point. They prefer fresh water where they eat aquatic vegetation, fish, tadpoles, and the eggs of other nesting birds. Most fly farther north for the breeding season. They build floating nests in one to four feet of water. More than one female may lay eggs in the nest of as many as 13 eggs. The black-bellied plover matches its name in the spring and summer when it's easy to identify. It can be seen in the large ponds at the Ding Darling Refuge, along the causeway and on the Gulf Shore. In late summer, the breast turns splotchy and then white. In the wintertime, the size and shape of the bird and the bill must be used for identification. The snowy is a small plover with a light colored back, some dark markings around the head, and white underneath. It has been seen along the causeway, but can more regularly be seen at Johnson Shoals on Kea Costa, or on the sand spit near the south end of Fort Myers Beach. Its numbers are dwindling as the beaches where they nest are disturbed. The females desert the young within six days, and a third of them re-nest with new males. The males tend the chicks for a month to seven weeks, and then half of them re-nest with a new mate. The Wilson's plover is very similar in color to the common semi-palmated plover. The bill is larger, and the legs have a dull pink color. They have been seen with other plovers on the causeway. The semi-palmated plover is the most common plover on Sanibel. It is seen near the dike in Ding Darling, on the Causeway Islands, and on islands in the bay. Take a telescope with you when looking for plovers. 
so that you can see the details of the bills and leg color which commonly distinguish them. Although the piping plover is an endangered bird, you'll find a few mixed in with the other plovers in the area. They nest on open sand beaches, but development and crowds have displaced many nesting areas. A group of about five was on the spit on Fort Myers Beach for most of last winter. The killdeer with two black rings around the neck is seen all year on many parts of Sanibel. From the mud flats during low tide in Ding Darling to the Bailey Tract and many grassy areas of the island. These young birds, about a week old, are being cared for on an island at the far end of the center pond in the Bailey Tract. The young chicks are mobile and can find food as soon as they're born, but they need protection until they can fly in about four weeks. They eat mostly insects, some invertebrates, and a few seeds. The parents will keep the chicks together and vigorously attack any other animal or bird that comes near. This new hatchling is on the gravel where the eggs were incubated. It still seeks warmth under the parent's wings. When you approach the chicks, the parent may go into the broken wing routine to draw your attention away from the young birds. The black neck still is a striking bird. It wears an immaculate tuxedo and has long pink legs and a piercing voice. The bird arrives in early spring and raises its young on the edges of the Sanibel River. The nest is placed just a few feet from the water's edge where the parents alternate in tending the eggs. The other mate guards the nest and fights with every intruder. The young can walk and feed as soon as they are born. The parents' legs are so long that it folds them forward so that the young just fit under the wings and down feathers on the breast. This bird is about two weeks old and is feeding along the edge of the southeast pond in the Bailey Tract. The parents follow the young, protecting them from any harm, and fly and scream at anyone who comes near.
They also teach them about alligators and other hazards. The young grow rapidly and look almost like their parents in about four weeks when they are ready to fly. The greater yellow legs can be seen on the flats in Ding Darling at low tide, on the Causeway Islands and on the Gulf Shore. They are usually very active in feeding on sand or mud flats, and they may bob a little as they walk, as the solitary sandpiper does. The yellow legs distinguish them from most other shore birds. The bill is slightly turned up and is usually two-toned with a lighter gray base. The lesser yellow legs can be found in the same places as the greater, but most migrate to South America in the winter, leaving only a few along our coast. It is difficult to distinguish them from each other. The lesser is somewhat smaller and less aggressive than the greater yellow legs. Its manner is more dainty. The bill is shorter, thinner, straight, and is uniformly dark. The call of the lesser has one to three notes, while the greater usually has three or more. Find one of the yellow legs and you may spend some time deciding which one it is. The Willet is a year-round residence and can be seen at the water's edge on all parts of the island. It's a rather plain bird, but when they spread their wings, they are striking. These birds have landed near the dike in the Ding Darling Refuge, where there is usually a group feeding on aquatic insects, crustaceans, worms, and sometimes fish. The willet is a bit larger than the black-bellied plover and smaller than the long-billed curlew, all in their summer plumage. Here you see one crying at the wind. The spotted sandpiper is easy to identify, not by any spots, because it doesn't have any in the winter when it is here, but by the way it tips up and down continuously as it works its way along the water's edge. The spots appear in the spring shortly before it leaves to breed from Georgia north. In the summer, the female defends a territory and mates with a string of males, one shown here, who each hatch a nest of eggs and raise the young with careful attention. These pictures of a few day old hatchling in the north shows that it starts its tipping action from birth. Ruddy turnstones are just what their name says, except on Sanibel, where they are usually turning pieces of shell rather than stones to find any food beneath. They rush along the shore of the bay, or less frequently the gulf, working at a great pace. Their colors get brighter with their breeding plumage in the summertime. They are still quite easy to recognize in the winter. The red knot is very easy to identify in the summer when the breast under the bill is a mahogany red. The shape is rounder than the Dunlin, 
and it's a bit larger. It can be found with other shorebirds along the bay and gulf shores and in Ding Darling. In the winter, identification is more difficult as the bird is the same color as many other shorebirds. You have to consider bill shape and length and leg color. The sonderling is found along the shore where it moves in and out with the waves while it searches for aquatic invertebrates with its bill stabbing the bottom. It's a small bird, just a shade larger than the smaller plovers. Although it has a brownish cast in the summer, it is one of the whitest of the shore birds in the winter, even whiter than the snowy plover. The western sandpipers gather to preen on the water's edge. These little birds were hunted as game birds. It is constantly moving as it probes for marine invertebrates in the shallow water. You can see how small this little bird with the black legs is when compared to this Wilson's plover. The least sandpiper is the smallest peep that you will find on the beach. It is somewhat smaller than the western sandpiper and is only three quarters as long as the sanderling. It has a brown bib and yellowish legs, which you may see if you're close enough and they are not covered with mud. It is commonly found on the flats at low tide in Ding Darling and on the bay and gulf beaches. The Dunlin is found with the other shore birds in Ding Darling and along the bay and gulf shores. The Dunlin is a larger bird and has a longer bill than the Sanderling that it is shown with here. In the summertime, the small black area on the belly helps to identify the bird. In the winter, a turned down bill shape and length must be used for identification because the feather colors are similar to those of many other birds. Okay. Short-billed dowagers have rather long bills. It is a communal bird that forms flocks with sandpipers and plovers. This picture shows their summer plumage. The birds can often be seen feeding with a rapid motion, stabbing the bottom like a sewing machine, frequently with the heads underwater. They can be found along the gulf, in the bay, and in Ding Darling, generally preferring the salt water. Open your lunch at the beach and you will soon have a flock of laughing gulls begging for a handout. They are the most common gull on Sanibel and they're with us all year long. In the summer breeding plumage, they have black heads with clear white eye rings and reddish bills and legs. In winter, the blackheads molt to white, but the eye rings remain visible and are the best identifier.
In fall and spring, there is an interesting mix of dark and light heads. The birds eat garbage and fish trimmings and have been increasing with a wealth of food. They have been reported as landing on the beaks of pelicans as they were swallowing small fish and stealing the fish from their pouches. They can sometimes be seen hawking insects in the air, as this picture shows. The ring-billed gull is common in winter along the causeway and gulf, generally in groups with other gulls and terns. The numbers are increasing because of the availability of fish scrap and garbage. This is a first winter bird. And here is a mature adult. Royal terns can be seen in mixed groups of gulls and other terns. In this case, mostly sandwich terns. They eat live fish, crabs and shrimp that they catch by plunge diving from 10 or 20 feet after hovering to spot the catch. The royal tern has an orange bill and black cap behind a white forehead. During the early part of the breeding season, the black cap extends forward to the bill. Look carefully at royal turns. The turn to the right is larger than the royal turn to the left and has a blood red bill rather than orange. It is a Caspian turn that is sometimes seen on Sanibel. The center bird nearest the camera is a sandwich turn in this mixed flock of pelicans, gulls, and terns. It is considerably smaller than the royal turns with the orange bills. The black eye spot goes to the back of the head. The terns eat live fish, shrimp, and squid that they dive for. They do not eat garbage or fish scrap as gulls do and are suffering from the crowding by the expanding gull population. The clear identifier for the sandwich tern is the dab of mayonnaise that is left on the tip of the bill. But you have to get close to see that. The sandwich tern can be seen on the Causeway Islands, the Gulf Shore, and near almost any water. Forster's terns are common on Sanibel in the wintertime and can be seen fishing along the Causeway bridges. They can usually be identified by the oval black eye patches that are not connected across the back of the head. They dive from about 12 feet to catch fish. In slow motion, they hover for a moment to spot the fish, dive headlong into the water, and then fly away. Unlike other terns, they eat some dead fish and frogs. The least tern is a gem on Sanibel during the spring and summer. It can be found around almost any water, hovering 10 or 20 feet above the surface until it sees a fish. 
and then diving headlong for it. Least terns nest during May on the causeway or other bay islands with open sand beaches. They lay two or three eggs in the bare sand or gravel, the pair sharing in the care of the eggs. They shade them to keep them from overheating in the sun and sit on them at night. They will fearlessly attack any intruder. The young walk away from the nest as soon as they are hatched. The parents bring them fish for about three weeks until they can fly and protect them from the fish crows and other predators that eat both the eggs and the hatchlings. Black skimmers should always be thought of as flying. They are such graceful birds. They can be seen in mixed flocks of pelicans, cormorants, gulls, terns, and skimmers on sandy beaches where they do not look as graceful. They feed by flying just over the water and dragging the longer lower mandible through the water to catch small fish. When it strikes a fish, the head is pushed back under the tail. The bird holds on to the fish and works it back to swallow before skimming again. They used to nest on the Causeway Islands, but the traffic, animals, and people caused their breeding success to be low. They have been lured away to one of the islands in the bay where their success has been much better. Morning doves are one of the most abundant birds throughout the country and are common all over Sanibel throughout the year. They perch on television antennas and on telephone lines everywhere. They form larger flocks in the winter and during midday, but spend the night dispersed. They usually lay two eggs in their poorly constructed nests, but then they lay eggs in other morning dove nests until most nests have three or four eggs for each of the two broods. The ground dove can be seen around the island in sunny areas on sandy ground with short vegetation. Here they are shown on the walks in the Bailey Tract, an area that they like. The rust color under the wings when they fly is quite apparent and is a good identifier. The common nighthawk can be seen during the daytime sleeping on a post or on a tree limb. They are more often heard with their buzzy beans beans call while flying around after insects.
you can hear the harsh rattling call of the solitary belted kingfisher as it defends its feeding territory along the water's edge around the island. It feeds by diving from a perch over the water to pick up fish, amphibians, reptiles, insects, or young birds. If a perch is not high enough over the water, it will fly up from a lower spot and hover for many seconds until it finds its food before plunging headlong for it. The birds are hard to photograph because they will spot anyone watching them and fly if he moves one step too close. The red-bellied is the most common woodpecker on Sanibel, and it's with us all year. Notice the black and white bars across the back, and the way it supports itself with its tail, as all woodpeckers do. Red-bellied woodpeckers are usually looking for insects under the bark of dead trees, although they eat some fruit and seeds as well. The male has a red top and nape on the neck, while the female has only the red nape. The immature has a gray crown as shown here. They nest in holes in deciduous trees or poles, or sometimes in birdhouses. It takes from seven to 10 days to drill a nest hole that they may use for several years. The northern flicker is a year-round resident that can be found in open woodland and residential areas. A flash of yellow from under its wings when it flies, an alternate short burst of wing beats and repeated glides signal its presence. The bird can often be seen feeding on the ground for the ants that are its major food. It nests in holes in trees, buildings, and birdhouses. It may have two broods of up to 12 eggs per nest. The pileated woodpecker is the largest of the woodpeckers in the country and is a year-round residence that nests on the island. Its large red crest is unmistakable. Its diet is mostly insects, particularly ants, that it digs from dead trees or from dead fronds on the palm trees. It also eats some fruit, nuts, and sap. It nests in tree cavities, including many in palm trees. The birds may roost in nesting holes from previous years. The pileated woodpecker is adapting to changes in its environment, and although its natural habitat is large trees in a large woods, it is increasingly found on smaller trees in residential areas. The great crested flycatcher is a year-round resident that nests in the area.
It has a gray throat that distinguishes it from other fly catchers that have white throats. Found in open woodlands, it feeds high in the canopy where it darts out and snaps up a flying insect. It also eats berries. The gray kingbird can be found in a narrow strip along the coast of Florida during the summer breeding season. It perches in the tops of the trees and fights with any birds that come near, especially large ones such as crows. It is common all over the island and nests in trees along the Sanibel River, in SCCF Center, and in the Bailey Tract. This picture shows a nest of babies in a low tree over the river. The tree swallow can be found on Sanibel in the winter. It darts around the sky catching insects. The clear white breast from top to bottom identifies it. Tree swallows often fly in flocks and are seen here decorating a tree. The northern rough-winged swallow is seen all year except in summer. It's a more solitary bird and flies with a more deliberate wing stroke than the other swallows. Virtually all of the crows that you see on Sanibel are the smaller fish crows. They fly in flocks and often perch high up in the trees and harass the smaller birds. Their call is a repeated ah, ah, rather than the caw of the American crow. They build rough crude nests of sticks, pine needles and leaves in the high crotch of large trees and raises a single brood of four or five young. They eat carrion, birds' eggs, fruit, berries, and seeds. I watched a few crows devour the young of a group of about 20 least terns nesting on the causeway. The Carolina wren is the largest of our eastern wrens and is lively, loud, nervous, and curious. It lives in undergrowth and brush piles where you can see it scolding, bobbing back and forth, and switching its long tail. The males will repeat a song many times from its 30 to 40 call repertoire. The blue-gray gnatcatcher can be seen flitting through the branches and wagging its tail actively in the low brush or tall trees along Wildlife Drive and on almost all parts of the island. It eats spiders and insects and can be identified by its white eye ring and white edge to the tail along with its blue-gray color.
The northern mockingbird is the state bird of Florida and is seen everywhere on power lines, trees, and brush. The bird will perform a mating dance, facing its mate. It also uses a similar dance as a territorial display, as shown here. This bird mimics all types of sounds, including hundreds of his own and over 50 other species. In spring and summer, the male sings for hours, both day and night, repeating each call three or more times. The brown thrasher repeats similar calls, usually twice each. European starlings are found everywhere, even on Sanibel. In the winter, they fly in flocks, frequently with blackbirds and grackles. Nesting in this area, they sometimes use old woodpecker holes in the palm trees. This hole on the corner of Periwinkle Way and Tarpon Bay Road has been occupied for many years. The yellow-rumped warbler used to be called the myrtle warbler in the east until it was combined with Audubon's warbler of the west into a single species. The yellow spots on the sides are more easily seen than the yellow spot on the rump when the bird is perching with its wings folded. They are gregarious, and are usually seen in groups. They eat berries in addition to insects. The prairie warbler is a year-round resident that nests in the area. It generally forages on brush and lower branches or mangrove. A dark line through the eye and a curved black line below the eye help to distinguish it from the palm warbler. The song will tell you when it is near. It bobs its tail, but not as much as the palm warbler. It's always hard to follow as it flits through the tree. The palm warbler is a winter resident of the island. It is found along woodland borders, in open brushy areas, and in marshes. The bird has less yellow than the prairie warbler and actively wags its tail as it forages. The brown cap that is hard to see in the field is brighter during the breeding season. The black and white warbler is with us except in the summer and is quite common. As it never stands still, running up and down and around the trees, it is very hard to follow.
The common yellow throat is a year-round resident that nests on the ground and stays low in grassy fields, shrubs, and marshes. You can frequently hear it calling from a perch atop brush or low branches. It feeds on insects, spiders, and a few seeds. The northern cardinal is a year-round resident that nests in this area. It feeds on insects and fruit and is commonly seen on shrubs and low trees. The female has more muted colors than the male. They are easily identified by the erect crest, the clear call, and the bright color of the male. The rufous-sided towhee can be heard, if not seen, in all seasons on Sanibel. Its piercing wheat call can be heard everywhere, and if you imitate it in the right habitat, the bird is sure to investigate and answer your every call. It also has a variety of other calls. The towhee can be heard in brushy habitat, thickets, and woodland edges that you will find at the SCCF Center, the Bailey Tract, and many other interior parts of the island. But it does not readily come out so that you can see it well. It nests on the ground in dense undergrowth, where it forages in the leaves, kicking them back with both feet at once in search of insects and seeds. It also eats some berries in season. The male red-winged blackbird displays the colors and defends the territory, chasing the crows away. The female is much smaller and different colored from the male. She alone builds the nest, lays the eggs, hatches them, and then does most of the work to feed the young. The birds can be seen around water throughout the year. In the spring, they nest in reeds above the water and raise two to six young. Both parents feed insects to the wide open mouths of the nestlings The larger one seems to get most of the food. The young leave the nest in less than two weeks before they can fly and perch on the reeds where the parents continue to feed them.
In the winter, the male birds often join in large flocks of grackles, starlings, and blackbirds. The boat tail grackles are common along the interior freshwater areas. The large V-shaped tail and glossy black feathers of the male are perfectly obvious. The female is more reticent and is a smaller brownish bird. Both the male and female birds have brown eyes in Florida. The common grackle has a yellow eye. They nest along the Sanibel River in the SCCF Nature Center and the Bailey Tract of the Refuge. Here a female has a tasty morsel and is looking for her young. She has found one, but not the right one, and won't give up the food. Grackles fly in small groups, mixed with blackbirds and starlings in the winter. This is the end of the Birds of Sanibel tape. The rare birds of Sanibel tape includes 107 additional species that are not seen as frequently. Now, get out and find the birds of Sanibel.